Hey everyone, thanks for joining me today. In case you're new here, my name is Bobby, and you're watching Gardening on Taylor Mountain. Let's take a quick tour of my cut flower garden, and I want to show you a new addition, something we've recently added in the cut flower garden. All of these beds that you're seeing here first are three by six by one foot deep, and they don't quite look the one foot deep the way you're seeing them because most of them are buried uh, in the ground a little bit. But these beds all have cool flowers in them. Some that I direct sowed in the autumn, some I planted out as transplants that I had grown under grow lights in the autumn, some that I grew under grow lights in the early spring and then transplanted them out before my last frost date. In this first bed, we're looking at stock. And if you're looking for a fragrant flower to grow in your garden, do grow stock. The variety here I grew is the Double Cats, and that's K-A-T-Z. I started these in February, grew them on, and then I planted them out, as I said, uh, before my last frost date. Stock is pretty much a one and done, although they do put off some side shoots, but the side shoots aren't as as good as the original bloom. So I've been cutting and cutting on those and I've been able to give away some bouquets. So love, love, love having stock. Definitely a repeat. In this next bed, I have uh, Rudbeckia. Some of the Rudbeckia, it's Maya Rudbeckia, Sahara Rudbeckia. It's some of that I started uh, as a transplant. I put it, I put it out last autumn and the bigger of the rudbeckia were my spring rudbeckia plants. So I think I'll continue to do the spring rudbeckia plants from now on. Behind that is Virgo feverfew. And this variety of feverfew, as you can see, gets really tall. Now all the hoops you're seeing are when the plants were real small, I had the hoops and I had bird netting over them just so a critter wouldn't come, you know, the bunnies, the early bunnies, bunny wouldn't come and munch down all my babies. So that's why you're seeing the hoop. And then if I felt like I needed to put some frost cloth on them, um, which I didn't need to, I had the hoops all ready to go. But back to the fever few, I was looking on the interior of this fever few, you can see a little bit of yellow there. And my best guess uh, for the reason for that would be maybe because the interior doesn't get enough sunlight, but I think it's because they've been getting a little too much water maybe. So this entire bed, the Rudbeckia, doesn't like a lot of water and it looks like likes it a little bit drier as well as I'm thinking the fever few. So I'm going to just be sure and not overwater that, but that's all getting ready to bloom. And this next bed is direct seeded Orlea and I sowed this last autumn. And behind that is green mist Ami. So I love the Orlea. Don't you just love that? Oh gosh. And it lasts a long time in the base. I'll swing around here real carefully. This is spring sowed Sweet William and it's getting some blooms on it. But from now on here in my zone 6B, I will go ahead and start these in the autumn and then transplant them out and let them overwinter here. So. Um, I think, you know, from what I can tell and from what I've heard, the fall sowed, the fall transplants of Sweet William here for my Zone 6B will be the better choice. Now, even for if you consider yourself a seasoned gardener, which I don't really, although I've been gardening for a long time, even seasoned gardeners or gardeners that have been gardening for a long time have duds. This entire bed is a dud bed. All of the plants are stunted. You can see here the cherry caramel phlox. Look at that, isn't that a joke? <laughs> it's even blooming. They're all stunted. I don't think it's because of the soil, although it could be, because the, they were stunted as little transplants. I don't know what the reason is. There's some stock, there's the cherry caramel phlox, and there's some more sweet william. Every one of them <laughs> are stunted. Oh, so I don't know what I'm gonna do. Maybe just see what the stock will do. The rest of them 
you can tell when a plant gets like that, it's not going to do anything completely stunted. You might as well rip it out and put something in there that like a pro cut sunflower, just use that space. Here's another semi failure in my garden this year. These are straw flowers and you can see these no dig raised beds I just stuck in here. But these are straw flowers. My straw flower seed was a couple of years old, several years old. And from now on, I will start with new straw flower seed, but they're just, they're growing, but very, very, very slowly. This, this should be a lot farther along, these straw flowers. And I'll show you some pictures here of my straw flowers in the past done so much better. Anyway, you live and learn. Now we'll walk into the enclosed part of my garden. And again, I, I'm sorry about my shadow, but as you walk in here, you'll see the, uh, let me close this gate. You'll see the Blue Boy Bachelor button that I direct sewed last autumn. And I've been cutting and cutting and drying a lot of them and then making arrangements uh, to give away and stuff like that. We we'll swing around here, this bed and prior years I have grown Gumfrina. That is another fail for me this year. My Gumfrina did not germinate very well at all and my Gumfrina seed was several years old. So again, I'm going to start with new seed on straw flowers and Gumfrina. And Gumfrina has been phenomenal for me in past years. This year, nope, I don't have any Gumfrina. So I have a friend that's going to one of our favorite uh, greenhouses in Lancaster County pretty soon, and I'm pretty sure they'll have some Gumfrina. She's going to pick it up for me. But what I'm showing you here is Crespedia. And I planted this out. I was under the impression that Crespedia was a uh, cool flower. And while I believe it is, you can see that it's just not wanting to grow, I figured out, I went back and looked at the seed packet and realized that Crespedia is a tender perennial. So that's probably why it's usually grown as an annual but that's probably why we're getting the slow growth because it takes the perennials just longer to grow. But they are growing, so I will use that mostly for drying. So we'll keep moving along here. You can see this is butter crunch lettuce that I grew from seed tape and we'll swing around in a minute and show you some better lettuce, but it's not loving it here in this barrel. So I won't do the lettuce, uh, the seed tape lettuce in the barrels anymore. And if you watched my video on growing celosia, you heard me say that if you've grown the wheat type before, you never need to plant it again. Well, here's the proof. This is all self-seeded. There's some plume in here, but it's mostly the wheat type. So I, every time I come in the garden, I thin it, I thin it, and then I planted a few leftover of the, uh, I think they're a coxcomb variety there. But <laughs> you will never need to plant the wheat type celosia again if you've planted it before. And this is forget-me-nots. Aren't they the cutest things? I just love them so, so much. The camera is not picking up the color very well because of the light on it. But I sewed these in a winter jug, in the winter jug method, on January 28th. And then after they got several inches tall, I transplanted them out into this little container. And I just love them so much. Oh, they're so cute. And then in this bed, these are the Vigo garden beds. I have three of those. And this is Fever Few that came back for me from last year. So it's getting ready to bloom. Then that's just a perennial pincushion flower that I have in there and a couple of salvia that I just stuck in there. Behind that is my Lysianthus. I think Lysianthus is probably my favorite, favorite cut flower of all time. I don't know. Now I did not grow my Lysianthus myself. Um, I have a really good source that I can get they're in between plugs and small plants, kind of the size of them, and they're very affordable. So they're all budding up. I love Lysianthus so much. And of course I have the Hordenova netting because they do need support. 
In this barrel, we have the St. Bridget anemones that I purchased from Longfield Gardens. I purchased the corms. They're just about gone over now, and I'll put up a picture of what they looked like in their peak. I enjoyed them so much. Oh gosh, they were so pretty. And I planted out the corms on January 28th, probably a little sooner than I should have, but they did just fine and they were very forgiving. I'll dig the corms once the foliage dies back. And I did throw some forget-me-not seeds in there. So they're getting ready to bloom and I'll plant something else there in the place of the, the anemones when they're done. And swinging around here, I have the peony poppy in this planter. I started these in the winter jug method on January 28th as well. And I put them out in this container when they were about four or five inches tall. And they're getting ready to, they're full of buds, getting ready to bloom. The foliage on the poppy always does this browning and yellowing as they get aged. So I'm not concerned about that at all. And I'll swing down here. I have another planter of poppies. These are Hungarian blue poppies, if we can get past these uh, bachelor's buttons. These are Hungarian blue poppies. I sowed them the same way in the winter jugs and then planted them out uh, after they got about five inches tall. You see they're already starting to make their seed heads, so that's what I will dry is the seed heads. And then down below in this barrel, I'll zoom in just a little bit, we have more poppies, and this was a pink poppy. I must have just sowed the seeds randomly at some point in the winter time or late winter. They're full of buds right now, but they're beautiful. It's a beautiful pink bloom. So. I love poppies so much. Then this bed here is fall sowed bupleurum that I sowed uh, from seed. And I don't cover my fall sowed anything. I don't cover it. I have the, um, the hoops on some of the areas in case I needed to, but I don't. And it got down really cold here in my zone 6B. So I'm kind of painting myself in a corner here in my beds. Uh, this bed here, this is classic romance bachelor's button and fall sewed there. I've been cutting a lot on that. And then this is pincushion flower that I grew inside under grow lights and then I transplanted it out before my last frost date. So they're doing well. There's some chives. And we'll swing around here. This is saponaria here that I just threw in there, some seeds. And behind that is status. And that's coming on. Status is a cool flower, but um, I probably didn't get it planted out early enough, but it, it'll be fine. It's starting to put on some bloom stalks there. And then I have a couple of Bells of Ireland. If you all have heard me before probably say that I've had such trouble with Bells of Ireland. I've tried to germinate them several ways, but you can see them there. I just threw some seed in there about eight weeks before my last frost date. And there they are. So that will be plenty. I have some in another bed here. That will be plenty for me because I've tried the paper towel method, just the whole nine yards, <laughs> Bills of Ireland, and I haven't gotten along real well. This is a bouquet dill that I just seeded. Let's see, let me see if I can see the date. Yes, on uh, April the 25th, I direct seeded that. And then you saw the bupleurum there. There's another shot of it. It's just so easy to grow and how pretty you know just to cut a bouquet of bupleurum and bring it in a big bouquet put it in a pretty vase it's really pretty this is eucalyptus some that I grew this is parvula gum here the smaller some that I grew that from seed so long it takes so long to grow eucalyptus and then some that I bought some this one on the end was from last year I just left it and in my zone 6B, it should not have lived through the winter, but it did. <laughs> this is yarrow. I use my yarrow as an annual, and I started them indoors under grow lights last autumn. And it was about mid-August that I start my fall sown, my fall started plants. And then I 
put out the transplants it did great over the winter so I need to go ahead and harvest some of that to dry and then there is a couple of bells of Ireland in here so anyway my little baby bells I'm taking care of those in this bed I have Cosmo and I have uh, giant marigolds so I'm excited about those some more Cosmo here in that barrel and I haven't planted out that barrel yet and these are all my uh, grasses the frosted explosion grass what else um, oh what's the other name I don't remember the name of the other one anyway last year and the year, prior years I've grown sunflowers from all my pro cuts or some of my pro cuts in this bed this year I decided to do all the grasses and the blue wheat I didn't get great germination on my blue wheat one two three four uh, four blue wheat plants only there because my seed again is old not great germination so but I I'm still on the fence about should I direct sow my grasses or should I start them indoors? Every year I kind of had a, have a problem. So please leave me a comment what you think about the different grasses. If you like to start yours indoors or, or you know, under grow lights or if you like to direct sow. This is my first succession of sunflowers and I planted these out before my last frost date. Same thing that I did last year and I covered them uh, with with frost cloth protection and they you know they're doing okay but they didn't do nearly as well as last year as far as the size and the strength of them but they're okay it's best if you have smaller flowers for your pro cut they are they arrange better you know they do better in a vase but anyway I have several successions coming on so they'll be fine and I have some more lettuce there that I I've just that lettuce has been in that bowl and I've been harvesting and harvesting off of it but it's been in that bowl for uh, gosh a long time since like the end of March <laughs> you can see some of my drip supplies there this is a St. John's wort that I've had here for several years and I do use it in cut flower arrangements it's, it's a shrub, but I also am on the fence, is it a perennial? Because it grows up from the ground. So I'm always like, is it a shrub? Is it a perennial? Well, I don't know. Anyway, there it is. Both of these raised beds here are two by four by one foot deep. And you can see some poppy seeds I just <laughs> threw in there uh, early in very, very early spring. This is all of my plume and coxcomb celosias. Now, let me say, it has been dipping down into the high 40s here, and you can see the celosia is just protecting itself. You see how it's just, I don't know, it's kind of just protecting itself against these little bit chilly. It's been chilly here in my zone 6B. Celosia is a, is a hot, it likes it hot, and it likes those just really warm, hot temperatures. And we have not been getting them here. And Personally, I love it, but the celosia doesn't love it as well. But it's okay. It'll be fine. These are just some extra snapdragons that I stuck in here. Some more celosia and some calendula there. That all I grew from seed. And swinging around here, you can see these carrots. These carrots were all planted using the seed tape. I got my seed tape from Park Seed. Let me see if I can move up here and so it's not so bright maybe a little better angle uh, so the carrots are looking good and then the beets these are Detroit dark red beets that I started indoors under grow lights and then planted them out I've already harvested uh, some beets and we had them we roasted them delicious these and this little this is an uh, antique wash basin that was used here on the farm I found it in one of the barns and I always grow my uh, some of my um, giant marigolds in in this little container this is the lettuce that I was talking about that I grew from the seed tape this is some butter crunch lettuce and these uh, and this little row here is bunching onions from the seed tape didn't do real well a lot of their that in the center didn't germinate and then this is a contender 
bush beans here coming up. And as soon as I take the rest of the beets out, I will sow more beans. This is uh, Zowie, what's the name of it? Zowie Zinnia, there we go. And then these are Benary's Giant Zinnia. Let me walk down here. Okay, Benary's Giant Zinnia. You can see I still have a lot more bed to fill. I have a lot of Zinnia growing on still, not quite ready to be transplanted out. And the rest of this bed will get filled with the Queenie series, Queen Lime Blotch, Queen Lime Mix. And in this bed, we have Snapdragons. They are getting ready to bloom, some of them. I started these, of course, early. You have to start your Snapdragons early. Started them in February. Transplanted them out before my last frost date. So this is the new addition to the garden this year or one of the new additions, uh, we decided to go ahead and put a hose link. This is a 50 foot hose link. I have two other 82 foot hose links in other areas, but I held off for a couple of years because I said, I don't, I couldn't figure out how it would work here in the garden for me. I just didn't think there was enough space. You can see everything is just, you know, tight in here. Everything is jammed uh, pretty closely together in here. But I finally said to my husband, I think I figured out it would work, or at least I want to give it a try. So he said, sure, go ahead. So um, we put the post in the ground. We did it the old farmer method with, we put three feet of the post in the ground and we chalked it in with rock instead of using cement. So that post is really solid in, in there. And it takes, there's a lot of weight on these hose links, so you do want to make them secure. And then, because, I'll swing you around here, because it's a good distance away from the hydrant, you can see there, we used a 25 foot, just a 25 foot garden hose. And that's worked really well. So if you have this situation and you can't put your hose link, or you don't want to put your hose link, real close to a hose bib or a hydrant or something like that, a faucet, then you can use a garden hose to go ahead and put it a distance away. So there we go, it's working really well. And you can see all of my menagerie here of my setup for my um, drip system and my timers and all. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? <laughs> oh, wow. It works and that's important. That's the important thing. I had to go back and figure out which zones were which. So I marked them with painter's tape to tell me uh, which zones were which. I think that's about it for today. This video is going to be a little bit longer than you're used to from me, uh, but I'll swing around and give you one final look and pan around. There's my little faux porch that my husband and my son-in-law built for me one Mother's Day. Love it so much. Really appreciate your support and I appreciate you being with me today. And until next time, friends, I hope you're enjoying your gardens. Happy gardening. Bye-bye.